Well, good morning, everybody. Good, morning. good to see everybody here this morning. It was a short summer, wasn't it? A little chilly out there this morning. We, Barbara and I had a chance to actually get our motorcycle out this week and did a little bit of traveling on it. But put it back in mothballs. Good to have you everybody here this morning. Welcome if you are here for the first time. Not for the first time today because we're all here for the first time today. But if you're here for the first time visiting us, make sure you fill out one of the visitor's cards that can be found in the back of the chair in front of you. Uh, we like to welcome you, acknowledge your visit, and we use that card as a means to do so. So please fill that out and then drop it in the little basket out there on the welcoming center. Good to have you all here this morning. You all look fine. Everybody smile. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> welcome out there in Facebook land. Good to have you here also. Linda, Pat, good to have you watching. A uh, few little announcements. Welcome back, Pastor John and Tina. <clears throat> if anybody saw a picture of him with his pink eye, not pink eye, pink eyes, he looked like a raccoon. But it's good to have you back. Good, good to have you back. We missed you. Uh, also, I don't know whether you noticed coming in the front driveway. The front of the building looks entirely different. I want to thank whoever, whoever and whoever helped that removed all those overgrown vegetation that was outside this wall that you could just barely see the church, but it looks 100% better. Thank you, whoever did that. I don't know who, would, but it looks good. Announcements. Business meeting this coming Thursday at 7. Normally our meetings are at 6-something, but it's at 7 o'clock, our business meeting at 7. Also, Vacation Bible School. There is a thing in your bulletin there. Acknowledge it. Make sure you let your neighbors know when our Vacation Bible School is. Uh, who can attend it and all that stuff so we can get the word out that uh, sometimes that's the first time a young'un will ever uh, hear the word of Jesus Christ. So please, please, please let that go. And that bottom line, that's for the people that come to it, not the workers. They don't have to go by that bottom line. Nobody must have read it. it says you must be potty broke. <laughs> So that's just the people that attend. Not... Okay, anything else that's not on the bulletin need to be addressed? Okay, turn off your cell phones. Get ready for uh, our worship service. We're going to have a minute or two of meet and greet. prayer this morning. And our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for allowing us to be in your house today. We thank you for the opportunity that we have here to, to worship you, to raise your banner high today. We pray, Father, that we know that you're among us. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts today. We pray that we, when we leave here today, that we'll be different than we was when we came. We just bless your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Where the earth suddenly I 
am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me in. Know oh, His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus
2 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 7 through 12 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus all also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken, have been set free, have been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that But now I am found 
celui-ci. I want to thank everybody for your prayers. It's good to be back. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm chapter 85. We're going to be in the book of Psalms today. Uh, but have you ever had a warning light come on in your car? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's, let's, let's be honest. How many here this morning has one on right at this moment in their car? Yeah. Uh, I was riding in a, a friend's car the other day, and we were on our way going somewhere. And uh, on the way there, I <clears throat> happened to glance over at the dash. And while I was glancing over at the dash, I noticed his check engine light was on. And uh, the interesting thing about that is I didn't really even give it that much thought. And uh, primarily, probably because I've driven a lot of cars throughout my life that have had the check engine light on, and I didn't give that much thought either. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, I ask who has had a warning light on in their car. Let's see the hands again. Okay, how many people has ever ignored the warning light in their car? Yeah, most of us, yeah. I mean, and that, and, that, and that seems to be the case. Oftentimes, warning lights come on, and we ignore them. And as long as the car is moving in a forward direction, we'll even give up reverse. But as long as it's going in a forward direction, we don't care what lights are on. Uh, uh, Tina used to work at an auto auction, and we'd go out and look at cars sometimes when we were going to buy a car, and... The guy who owned the auction says, I can take care of that light. I got a piece of tape. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it can be for a minor reason. Sometimes it can be for a major reason. Uh, sometimes, see the, I mean, it sometimes seems, though, that we just ignore them. And uh, today, though, I want, I want us to, to ask this question is, how do you know if you are in spiritual danger? Is there a warning light? Well, yes, there is. And today I, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, and the title of my message is Warning Lights, but today I want us to look at the message, or the, this passage of Scripture some, from Psalm chapter 85, verse 6, because there I believe we will see the warning light uh, for spiritual danger. Let's read there. It says there in Psalm 85, Verse 6 says, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Let's read that together out loud. I know I, I let's read that together one more time, together out loud. It's a pretty short passage of scripture. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Now you might say, Well, where is the warning light in that? passage of scripture. Well, the warning light is this. You are in spiritual danger if you have lost your joy. Let me say that again. You are in spiritual danger if you lost your joy. Look at that with me again, that passage of scripture, Psalm 85 verse 6. It says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? You see, they were saying they needed revival because, and the evidence of that was, they lost their joy. You see, one way that you can know that you are in spiritual danger is if you lost your joy. Now, how is this the case? Well, I came across this illustration, which is very fitting for this part of the country. This part of the country is coal mining country, right? We are in the heart of coal mining Ohio. And coal miners know that there's dangerous gases that can gather silently and secretly in the coal mine. In fact, carbon monoxide can asphyxiate coal miners, and methane can explode. In fact, in 2006, in the Sago mine, or Sago mine in West Virginia, 12 men lost their lives to a methane explosion. In 1906, in France, 
there was a massive chain of explosions that killed 1,100 miners. But in the early days of coal mining, they realized that there was a very uh, effective, low-tech solution to this problem. Does anybody know what it is? A canary, right. They would bring a canary in to the mine, and a, and a canary's metabolism is very sensitive to air quality. And as long as this bright yellow bird chirped and sang, miners knew the air was safe. But if gas levels rise or rose, guess what happened? The canary stops singing. He wobbles on his perch and eventually falls to the floor. If you're in a coal mine and you look over, and all of it, if, if you stop hearing the singing canary and you look over and you see him laying on the bottom of the cage, you know it's time to get out. That's a warning sign. And you see, Christian joy is like that singing yellow bird. Once, or one of the first effects of sin or doctrinal error in our life is we lose the joy that is in Christ. And when your heart stops singing, that's a warning that you need to take a closer look. Perhaps you may need to evacuate. You may need to get out. You need to pay attention to what's going on. See, if our soul is truly satisfied with Christ, then there's going to be a joy in our heart. But if we take our eyes off of Christ, then guess what? We're going to lose that joy. We're going to lose that excitement. And Christian joy is a barometer for our spiritual life. In John chapter 15, verse 10 through 11, Jesus said this, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You know, the biggest cause for the loss of joy in our life is sin. You know, when we start sinning, when we start giving in to sin, when we start allowing the world, uh, uh, the things of the world to come into our life, we lose the joy that we have in Christ. A great example of this is found in Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David had sinned. David had committed adultery. David had committed murder. And Nathan the prophet called him out on it. And there in Psalm 51, David was remorseful. And after all of that, here in this psalm, this is what he wrote. He said, have mercy Upon me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, and you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the, in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear, look at what he says, make me hear joy and gladness. You see, because of his sin, he was no longer happy. He no longer had the joy of the Lord. It says that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. See, there we see that God deals with us when it comes to our sin. The bones that you have broken. And he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now look at this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. 
then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will be converted to you. Before we transition out of this slide, I want to notice that last line again. Look at what he says. He said all of this. He, he, he poured out his heart to God. He had committed adultery. He murdered the woman's husband to try to cover it up, to try to cover his shame, to try to get back his honor as the king. And what does he do? He gets called out and he pours out his heart to God. He goes, look, I've sinned. I've done a terrible thing. I've gotten way off track. You know, sometimes it can happen so quick and so easily. And we can be in over our head before we know what's going on. He said, I've sinned. I'm sorry. Please give me your mercy. Give me your grace. Don't take your presence from me. Be here with me, God. But then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, I've lost the joy. Now look at what he says of your salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then he goes on to say, and then I will share the gospel. I mean, in, sense, in essence, then transgressors will be converted to you. In other words, before we could go out and witness to people, because people, do you think they're going to want to uh, listen to us if we don't have the joy of the Lord? No. He goes, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and then I will win sinners to you. So, the first evidence, the, 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 the thing I want us to notice this morning is this. You're in spiritual danger if you've lost the joy of your salvation. If you've lost the joy of God's salvation. If you don't have the joy that you once had, that's a warning light. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. Well, the next thing I want us to notice, if you've lost your joy, you need to be revived. That's the number, that's the, the second thing. Look at what it says there in Psalm 85, 6 again. Will you not revive us again? You see, this, this passage is a prayer of revival. This passage, he says, will you not revive us that we may rejoice in you? Why we lost our joy and now we need to rejoice in you. Now this passage, it's not very clear. It's not specifically stated that this is referring to Babylonian captivity. It could apply to any kind of captivity. But the nation of Israel had this, this they seemed to go in this cycle where they would, they would get on fire for God. They would, you know, they would have a good king that would cast out all of these idols. You know, things would be going good. And the next thing you know, they would sin. And God would take and send them into captivity. And then God would cleanse them. And then they, they, would, they would have some, there would be repentance. And then, they, and then they, they would go through this cycle throughout the history of, nation, of Israel. There would be good kings and there would be bad kings. And here in this passage of scripture, we don't really know what cycle specifically this was in, but yet we see here this prayer. Will you not revive us again? Well, that brings about a question. What is revival? How many people's familiar with the popular revival that happened this year? Where was it? Asbury, yes. The Asbury Revival of 2023, it was, it was attended by approximately 15,000 people a day. By the end, it brought in 50 to 70,000 visitors. 50 to 70,000 people. When we think of revival, oftentimes that is what we think of. We think of a big meeting. You know, like the Holy Spirit moving and people in the church, you know, coming forward and, and pouring out their hearts to God. But what is Christian revival? Well, gotquestions.org answers that. It says revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from, listen to this, a state of dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. Let me ask you this this morning. Do you feel like your spiritual life is stagnant? 
Or do you feel like you're on fire? If your spiritual life is stagnant, evidence of that will be a lack of joy. If your spiritual life is on fire, you're going to have joy. But here it says, revival refers to a spiritual reawakening. It goes on to say it encompasses the resurfacing of a love for God. An appreciation of God's holiness. A passion for his word. A passion for his church. A conviction or a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin. A spirit of humility and a desire for repentance and growth and righteousness. You know, the first great revival in the United States was called the First Great Awakening. It took place in the 1730s, and, and it made a permanent mark on Christianity in the United States. And out of that revival, powerful preaching deeply moved Christians to two things. If you're taking notes, this is a good, these are two good things right now. First of all, a convicting a convicting awareness of personal guilt. You know, I think the first evidence of revival is conviction, is feeling guilty for our sin, is realizing how holy and righteous God is and how far from that we are. Remember when Peter... Jesus called Peter, and they were out fishing, and Jesus said, hey, cast your nets on the other side of the boat, and because they had been out fishing all night, and all right, well, we will. It's interesting when we do what Jesus asks us to do, it, typically there's good results, right? So what happened? He cast his nets on the other side of the boat, and he caught a lot of fish. I believe right then and there, Peter realized who Jesus was. Because what did he do? He said, depart from me. I'm a man of sin. I'm a man of iniquity. You see, that's what we need when we come to God. Needing revival is a sense of conviction, a sense of personal guilt for what we've done. I mean, the truth of the matter is we don't want that. We don't want to feel guilty about what we're doing. We want, we want to... Just try to ignore it. So a convicting awareness of personal guilt. But the second thing is this, the awesome nature of salvation through Christ. You know, church had turned into a dry, ritual, rote ceremony. But here this first great awakening made it pers intensely personal. It was about a personal relationship with God. It was about God moving in my heart, God working in my life, God convicting me of my sin, and me confessing it to God and turning from it. In many aspects, revival replicates our salvation experience. It's, it's, it's like being saved all over again. Now, we... Don't believe that you're saved all over again, but and, and in, in essence, that's what it seems like because there's a conviction of guilt, there's a surrendering of our will, and then there's this immense amount of release, this, this relief that God has taken off of our life because we've surrendered to him, because we've confessed our sin, because we've truly repented and turned from our sin. You know, Christ's letter to the seven churches reveals circumstances that necessitate, necessitate revival. And the one I think that always stands out to me is the church that lost their first love. You've left your first love. And here's why. I believe that whenever we sin, we're essentially saying, I love this more than I love God. That's why Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if there's something that you're struggling with in your life, a sin perhaps that, you know, you, you find yourself giving in to, I want to encourage you, when, when, when you want to give in to that sin, say this out loud, I love you more than I love God. 
Think about that. Whatever that sin might be, say it out when you're getting ready to commit it. Say that out loud. I love you more than I love God. Because in essence, that is what you are saying when we sin. That's what we are saying when we sin. We love this one thing more than we love God. And that's, where our, that's why we have to focus on our love for God, not on necessarily avoidance of sin. If we love God, we'll avoid sin. But oftentimes we become performance-oriented. You know, we, uh, that's it. I'm not going to have these thoughts. I'm not going to have this attitude. I'm going to turn from this attitude. I'm going to turn over no leaf. That's it. I'm going to be a better person. I'm tired of messing up. I've messed up for the last time. Have you ever felt that way? Man, how many times am I going to do this? See, your, your, your emphasis is on the wrong thing. Your emphasis there is on I, me, not God. Not what God can do in you. Not what God can do through you. But the fact that I've, I've, I've sinned, I've done it, I've blown it. You ever felt like God's just given up on you? I mean, I literally have people. I've had somebody this last week ask me this. They said, do you think there's still hope for me? You think, I, you think I, there's still hope for me? You know what? If we focus on ourselves, no. And if you read Romans when Paul, he goes through that whole thing where he said, you know what? I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do, and... Oh, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thank God, Jesus Christ. That's the answer. Jesus Christ. You see, he is sufficient. You know, I don't have to stand up here and tell you all the things that you do wrong. You know it. When I say what sin so easily ensnares you, it comes to your mind. And you think, man, I just can't overcome that. Because your focus isn't on your love for God. Your focus is on your sin. Your focus isn't on the sufficiency of Christ. Your focus is on your willpower. And you'll never overcome sin through your willpower. Jesus said, who I've set free is free indeed. See, if you've lost your joy, you need to be revived. Now, third thing I want us to notice here, and the final thing, is this. To experience revival, we must do two things. Pray and repent. Look at this passage of Scripture one final time. Okay? This is a prayer. Will you not revive us? And look at what he says again. How many times do we need revival? <laughs> Apparently more than once. Will you not revive us again and again and again? Will you not revive? It's a prayer. There's a prayer that your people may rejoice in you. See, there's, there's a repentance. There's this turning from this idea that I don't have joy because there's sin in my life, and I acknowledge that, and now I want to come back to God and turn from my sin and trust God, and I'm asking God to do something. You see, who does the, who's involved in a revival here? Look at this passage of Scripture. God and us. Will you, that's if you notice that you there's capitalized, it's because he's talking to God. Will you, God, not revive us? Who does the reviving? Is it something that we manufacture in ourselves? No, it's God. Will you, God, God, Revival, true revival, is not just an emotional experience. It's a move of the Holy Spirit. Will you not revive us again? We are the ones that need revived. We are the ones that need a work of the Holy Spirit. We are the ones that need to repent. We are the ones that need to turn from our, our, our being so overcome with the things of this world and distracted by the things of this world and trust and find our joy in Christ. A revival starts with prayer. C.S. Lewis said, the moment you wake up each morning, 
All your wishes and hopes for the day rush in at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists of shoving it all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. He's talking about prayer. John Bunyan says this, he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. Martin Luther says, the fewer the words, listen to this, the better the prayer. To have prayed well is to have studied well. In 1 Thessalonians, we're told to pray without ceasing. And everything gives thanks. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And here in this passage of Scripture, we're reminded again, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice? See, there's a purpose for prayer. Prayer is an opportunity that we give thanks to God, but it's also an opportunity that we confess our sin. But in most cases, our prayer life involves, God, would you, <laughs> would you please take away this sickness? Will you please cure my eyes? Friday night, <laughs> Tina was out of state, I got this infection in my eye so bad, they were both blood red. And uh, around my eyes was blood red. And it was like looking through Vaseline. And, I mean, I could, cl I could put, you know, artificial tears in them, get them cleaned out so I could see. And I'm thinking, man, I need to go to the doctor. I need to go to the ER or something. And, and it's kind of funny how all these... Whenever I think that I need to go to the doctor, it's always on a weekend. <laughs> you ever notice that? It's like, why can't I get a, why can't I just, why can't I get sick or feel a need to go to the doctor during the weekday? It's always on a weekend. It was Friday night, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, if I go to bed, I probably won't be able to open my eyes tomorrow, and I probably definitely won't be able to sleep. So I better drive myself to the ER tonight. So I got my eyes cleaned out. I mean, it was brutal. But you know what I was praying for last week? <laughs> God, make this go away. <laughs> and oftentimes that's what we pray for. God, do this. God, do that. God, take care of this mess that I got myself in. But what about God, forgive me. God, thank you. God, I love you. See, there's a purpose for prayer, but there's power in prayer. In Psalms 91, look at what it says here with this. In verse 14, says, because he has sent his love, or set his love, rather, he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. Who has set his love upon who? Notice that me there is capitalized. This is God speaking. Because he has set his love upon me. Where should our focus be? On our love for God. He has set his love upon me. Therefore, I, God, will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and what? I will answer him. That is a promise that we can claim when we call upon the name of the Lord, he will hear us and he will answer us. Now, he might not just answer us in the, yes, here you go. Might be, yes, here you go, or no, not, no, or maybe, wait. You know, God answers prayers in three ways, yes, no, or wait. But he will answer us, and there's power, not in the prayer that we pray, but in who hears it. He says, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will, look at that, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You know, so many times in life, this is what sin is. Sin is our desire to satisfy ourselves apart from God. 
When we try to find pleasure, when we try to find satisfaction apart from God, that's when we give in to sin. But you know what? There is no real satisfaction apart from God. I will deliver him. I will honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him what my salvation. To experience revival, we must pray. William Barclay and Prodigals and those who, we, those who love said this, when we pray, remember that the love of God, remember, sorry, the love of God that wants the best for us. When we pray, remember the wisdom of God that knows what is best for us. And thirdly, the power of God that can accomplish it. Accomplish it. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes people. Prayer changes lives. Prayer changes circumstances. Prayer starts revivals. And prayer changes us. Why? Because prayer is asking the God, prayer is asking God to do what we can't do on our own, and that is change. We need a change. You know, that's what repentance is. A, an illustration of repentance is this. You're going this way, and then you stop, and you turn around. That's an illustration of repentance. An illustration of repentance is turning around. It's a change in direction. When preachers say, repent and believe in the gospel, it means turn your, change your mind, have a direction, a change of life, a, think differently. Prayer changes us. Prayer has a purpose, there's power in prayer, but there's also a practice of prayer. And revival prayer must begin by asking God to change us. Psalm 139, 23 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know what? Sin is deceptive. It can move into our life in such a gradual way. It can blind us. And that's why the, the psalmist here is saying, Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties. And if there's any wicked way in me, Lead me out of it. Today I want to encourage us to pray for God to search us. Sin is very deceitful and it hides. And where does it hide? In our hearts. John Bunyan said this, Prayer will make a man cease from sin or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Let me say that again, because that's worth repeating. Prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. You say, well, how's your joy? That's one warning light. Well, how's your prayer life? If your prayer life has gone down the drain, probably... Your joy is with it. Revival prayer begins by asking God to change us, but revival prayer also begins or includes praying for other Christians. Another quote from the great John Bunyan, when thou prayest, he says, let Rather, let thy heart be without words than thy words with be, be without heart. Man, I wish I could come up with stuff like that. Let me say that again. When you pray, let your heart be, it's better to let your heart be without words than your words to be without heart. Are you meaning what you're saying? Revival prayer starts with us, and then it goes, it moves towards other believers, and then finally it culminates in the prayer for the lost. Today I call each of us to prayer. Pray. Really pray. We need prayer. This church needs prayer. Your pastor needs prayer, not just to feel better either. This community needs prayer. This country, 
Our culture more than ever needs prayer. This world needs prayer. And if we want to pray, then we must be, or if we want revival, we must be willing to first pray and second repent. And how do we know if we need to repent? Well, do you have the joy that you had when you were first saved? Think about that. Do you have that same joy? Now, do you have, I know that relationships mature, right? No, when you first get saved, there's like a honeymoon period. But there's a joy in your heart that wasn't there before. If you've never experienced that, then I think you probably need to question yourself, have I ever been saved? When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he lifts the burden of all that guilt and shame, there's something that takes place in your heart and your life that you can't explain and you feel like a new person. Why? Because you are a new person. You, the Bible says all things have become new, old things have passed away. You're a new creation and there's a joy that you have that's inexplainable that can only come from God. And that joy causes us to go out and tell others about it. You're not going to believe what happened to me. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and now the guilt and the weight of my sin is lifted off of my life. I feel like I'm a light person, like I could just float around. I feel like I, 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 I can't explain it. There's something that's happened in me. But then guess what happened? Time goes by. Sin creeps into our life. We lose our joy. And we stop telling others. We stop sharing the gospel. Why? Because there's nothing in our life anymore that's worth sharing. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus Christ isn't worth sharing. But to our perspective, we don't have joy. We're, we've, we've messed up. We're, we're caught maybe in a sin. We're, we've had a bitter attitude. We're not forgiving somebody. And what happens? We lose our joy. Today, where is our joy? If your joy isn't full in the Lord, I think we ought to take a look at our life. Because if our joy isn't full, remember what David said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will come to repentance. See, if we truly want to share this good news, this gospel, this thing that changed us, first of all, it has to change us. And secondly, if it's changed us and we've given in to sin, we need to repent. We need revive. And you know what? That happens over and over and over again. We need revival. You know, that's why we come to church on Sunday. So that we can be revived. I mean, walking through this dirty, filthy world gets tiresome. And you know what? We come to Jesus, and we come to Jesus, and we're like, man, I need a bath. Save me, Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, you don't need a bath. You just need to have your feet washed. Just like he told Peter. No, I, 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 you don't need a bath. You've already been saved. You've just walked through a dirty world. And let me wash your feet. Today, do you need Jesus to wash your feet? Let's stand. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. If God is speaking to your heart today. I, as we sing this song, I invite you to come forward and pray and pour out your heart to God. There's a specific sin that the Holy Spirit right now is convicting you of. I want you to come forward and repent of it. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today I, I plead with you, repent and trust Jesus Christ. If you want to come talk to me about it, if you want me to pray with you about it, whatever God's dealing with and laying upon your heart as we sing right now, don't put it off. Let's tell God 
We love you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for what you're doing here in our hearts today. And we pray, Lord, in this moment that you would just speak to us and challenge us and draw us closer to you and that we would pray for revival and it would start with us, that it would start with me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Return to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You struck down to buy me up, you say you do it all in love, that I might know you in your suffering. Slay me, yet I will praise you, though you take from me. I will bless your name, though you ruin me. Still I will worship, sing a song. To the one who's all I need My heart and flesh may fail The earth below give away But with my eyes, with my eyes I'll see the Lord Lifted high upon that day, behold the Lamb that was slain, and I'll know that every tear was worth it all. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you, though you take from me I will bless your name though you ruin me still I will worship sing a song to the one who's all I Tonight I'm crying out Let this cup pass from me now You're still more than I need You're enough for me You're enough
close out in prayer, but just a reminder, this Thursday night is a business meeting, and the elders and I will be presenting something we're pretty excited about. Uh, so please come and be a part of that. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. And uh, we pray, Lord, that this could be the spark that grows into a flame, that grows into a fire of revival. Thank you, God, for what you're doing here in our hearts, God. And we pray, Lord, that you please don't stop moving. Move in people's hearts. God, revival, I believe, is a, is a gift from you. And right now, I feel, God, right now, we need it. We need a move, a fresh move of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's children said, Amen. Amen.